Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Purple Noon, a podcast. I am Stephanie Conti, and I am here today with the protagonist to my meal, Savannah Lanause. Hi, guys. You doing okay? That was a little low energy. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> you hear the? Uh, there's just a lot of background noise going on. Am I loud? Well, so- no, no right. you're not. You're good. You're good. But I do because you are in Puerto Rico now. You've migrated down a little more south. I can faintly hear the cookies. The cookies, yeah. <laughs> in the background. God, I hate them. I I don't like frogs. So just the fact that I have to fall asleep to a million of them singing. <laughs> <laughs> I. I will say, I don't know if you've ever, it used to be such a huge problem a few years ago. And I think it's because they only come back like every seven years or so, (laughs) or I could be wrong, but cicadas, I can't stand the sound of cicadas. What is that? Oh, they're, it's such a, it's so hard to describe. It's kind of like the cat, like, no, not caterpillar, the cricket version of a cookie. That's disgusting. But it's just, I, there's something about it. It's one of those things where I haven't heard it in such a long time. But if I heard it, I'd be like, oh, the cicadas. I just don't like the, the noise of cicadas and stuff like that. I think Nature animal- sounds like waterfalls and lightning yeah. and things like that. Very nice. But the sounds of like bugs. Just like no. animals and like unison. I don't like it. I will say, like, because normally I would be like, oh, but, like, maybe, like, an animal. But then when I realize, like, if you're just listening to it and not seeing it, any animal that just decides to take off can easily be any type of animal. What I mean by that is whenever I walk out of my house, I live in Florida, lots of lizards. Dude, but I These like lizards the lizard. are so fat, they sound like snakes. They do. They, when they ruffle in the trees, that's what oh they're my God. used to. Like, I could never distinguish, like, oh, like, that's just that's just a little bunny in the thing. Like, my first always instinct is snake. Snake. Because there's so much exactly, construction, yeah, that's cause... when the snakes come out. I'm like, it's a snake. Or a gator. We're not even snakes. by water, and it's gator. <laughs> but, We're going to um, get, like, yes. an email from PETA or something. Especially me. I always talk about how I hate frogs. You know what? I don't think – here's the thing. If you were like <laughs> – you're just saying like, oh, I don't like frogs. Now, here's the issue. If you were like saying like, I don't like frogs, I'm, you know, sharpening up a a mohawk and I'm just going to start, you know, chopping left and right. Like if you start like hunting frogs, <laughs> like some type of sport game, then I think there'd be an issue because that's a little excessive, you know? You just I'll carve just out a little spear. To myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, oh, so you know what? I'm really, because I think by the time this uh, podcast comes out, I'm really excited for it. It's not super like movie related and everything, but um, it is TV related. I'm so excited for the latest Euphoria episode. What is it coming out? It comes out, um, I want to say the 22nd, 24th. Ooh, so like two, three this days. This Saturday. So we're recording on Monday or Tuesday right now. So we, I think it's this Saturday. Okay, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really, really excited for that. And also, um, did you hear, this is kind of like by the time this is posted, it's kind of old news. But did you hear what Netflix is doing? No. Dude, so, okay, so starting, I think it was last week from when this was recorded, starting last week, Netflix has a brand new Netflix original movie coming out every single week for a year. Beautiful. I know. But it's also so crazy to think that they're just hoarding 52 movies i mean i wonder if that was their plan all along or they're just taking advantage of the pandemic because they know people aren't going to the movies so 
they're just like now is the best time to just and I'm sure because of COVID because a lot of the stuff is still in production so uh, not like a lot a lot but things some things are still in production so I'm wondering if there maybe COVID delays might happen and things like that I have a feeling but overall like they have a really good lineup like, they started off strong. Like, they introduced um, Malcolm and Marie. And now, all of a sudden, we see this super, super quick, kind of a BS trailer, if I'm going to say so, like because it literally gave out nothing with Leo. I saw it in, in, in Jennifer Lawrence, right? Yep. It was just a little snippet. Just, just the tiniest little thing. And I was like, you just gave us that. That's it. Come on. Ah, uh, wow. I'm excited. I heard it was about climate change. Is that true? I heard it was about aliens. Don't know what I'm talking about then. <laughs> no, I like I heard it's nowhere. something about like, oh, no, no, no. It's not aliens. It's something like a meteorite is going to hit the earth type of deal. And they oh, they go to figure it out. And I'm like, okay, here's the thing. It could be, but that's one of those type of plots where it's like it could be done very well if they got the right people or it could just be like every other movie in that genre i agree i hope because i I know it's gonna sound pretentious but like since leo is in it i hope there's some standards because we all know how like the doomsday genre is you know we don't want armageddon or things like that and I, i will say like let's be totally honest it's been a while since Leo has only done a okay film. Like oh, that this man, dude, yeah. like he just he's just putting out bangers. So, I mean, I'm I'm trusting him at this point. I'm not trusting the director. I don't even know who the director is. I'm not trusting the director. I'm not trusting the writer. I'm not tr- trusting anyone except him because it's like, dude, you've been super selective. Yeah, he's been consistent. He's been very consistent. Like, and he's like the, he seems like the type of actor who luckily can just do what he wants. And he also doesn't seem the type of actor to do things for money. Like every project that it seems like he's been on within like the past at least five years has been because he wanted to do it and not because he was bought into doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's mm-hmm. going to be good. I want to talk to you about the 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 blasphemy you sent me on Twitter. Blasphemy? What? <laughs> the, the Willy Wonka thing? Because oh, yeah. I was very so, distraught when I saw that. Oh, my God. Yeah, so today they just announced that they're doing a Wonka prequel. And they're eyeing at little Timothy Chamelet and everyone's favorite little little webbed boy <laughs> tom holland dude what you pick I, I also kind of like want to go like hey you do realize there's like other young male actors right That's what I'm like saying. I, like i get it they're talented don't get me wrong but it's like dude like both of them they can't be monopolizing the industry like this you know there's other people because they're around our age so I yeah. feel like they could have maybe picked somebody new or I also can't see them because Willy Wonka is really eccentric. He's an eccentric character. So I really can't see them doing like goofy stuff. It's, uh, you know what? And I'm just going to say it because I'm just going to say it. Willy Wonka should not be hot. I'm just going to put it <laughs> out there. Like, I don't want to see like a good looking Wonka. Give me a weirdo. You know, give me just someone who's just like, oh, like. He's the only, like, I, I really want, like, just a a weird-looking Wonka. Yeah, I do, too. I, I mean, he could be charming, because I feel like the first one was charming. But I don't think, first of all, the first one was, like, 40 years old, too. So, obviously, the, I, I like you said, I don't think really Wonka should be a sex symbol. Like, I think the dude should be able to be cute, but, like, not, like, conventionally good-looking, you know? Yeah, and I don't know. They're, they're both just very young looking. Unless they're going for like someone that looks 18 years old. Eh. I still think like honestly like when I think Wonka, like I I think more not Tom Holland, not little Chalamet or anything like that. I'm thinking more like Freddie Highmore 
or are you, so what are those guys? You pick, know, good pick. That's you know, good. just like someone who's been like a consistently good actor who kind of can bring like that eccentricness. Like the only other person, like the only other, like if they were younger, a very attractive person who could play that role, honestly, little young Johnny Depp, but we don't have a time machine. Well, he was Willy Wonka. Well, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that totally makes sense now why it works. <laughs> I was just imagining like was, him like, like in Edward Wonka. Scissorhands phase, like yeah. during those years, because he could have played a good Wonka, young Wonka then too. Yeah, we, we definitely need somebody on the weirder side. He'd be cute, but not sex symbol. Yeah, because I don't want to see like Wonka all of a sudden come out like Baywatch's Zac Efron, you know, where everyone was just like, how did you do that to your abs? Like, I don't want to learn. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Agreed. I'm also like, I'm wondering like, which Wonka are they talking? Are they talking Johnny Depp's Wonka? Or are they talking Gene Wilder? Because if it's Gene Wilder Wonka, he needs to be a weirdo. Like he needs to be like, almost like a young Cosmo Kramer looking guy in order to sell the role to me. <laughs> I think they're going for like Gene Wilder because the picture was there. And they also would, with Johnny Depp's Willy Wonka, they do give you a backstory um, like a little bit. So I don't know why they would put the newer Willy Wonka. I think it would be based on the old one because you don't really know how he became like this candy person. Yeah. What a weird so movie it, that was. It, 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 you know, it, it just, it doesn't settle with me. They're trying to add all these very, very talented, but just too pretty. I don't need like, a prequel to Willy Wonka either. Who's asking? I mean, I to be. For that. Well, well, like, and you know that weird theory where everyone thinks Snowpiercer is a, like, that's how weird I think having a, a, a Willy Wonka prequel is is the fact that so many people are like also saying like why do we have need this when we have Snowpiercer as the prequel it's like no who told you that was the prequel <laughs> people, do you know how many people think a- Chris Evans's movie the Bong Joon Ho movie Snowpiercer is a Willy Wonka prequel but in what way I didn't maybe too I too many it. They, there's just I relentless didn't. theories and it's like guys go to sleep like I know the people are the writers theories are like, there just looking at all these theories about 3 a.m. <laughs> on Reddit drinking Mountain Dew. That's a recipe for a disaster. And that is what happened with those snowpiercer theories. Yeah. No, we don't we don't stand for that. So Willy Wonka prequel, uh take it or leave it. I say leave it. Make some other this is podcasts. not a like a, a movie <laughs> news and you know podcast, but you know what? We just had to give our little two cents in. Yeah, we don't like it. Nothing wrong with that. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But without further ado, are you ready to get into the reviews? Excited. Okay, so we're gonna start it off. So I'm gonna introduce Daddy. You're gonna introduce the behemoth tenant. Perfect. So I will begin. Uh, First off, we have a short film called Daddy that came out in 2019, and it's written and directed by Christian Coppola, who is, as the name says, a distant relative of the Coppolas. So after the death of his wife, an 80-year-old man checks into the Plaza Hotel to celebrate their first anniversary apart, hiring a male escort to take her place. So it stars Ron Rifkin, Dylan Sprouse, and Catherine Wolfe. So, Savannah, you and I, we actually were able to, you know, COVID safe and COVID friendly, watch this together. Yeah. We and it was, it, it was, I will say this director automatically has such an advantage to pulling people in with this film because not only because of the title Daddy, but because he's a Coppola. So without like, before we get into the spoilers, what did you think of Daddy? It was very bold. Um, Like the person that obviously, if it was Coppola that wrote the whole thing, he was definitely going for like the shock factor. Yeah. Um, But besides that, it is a very unique perspective you get to look into. Um, I'm trying to dance around the spoilers. But my biggest complaint is, and I know most short films 
people will say this, but in particular, this should have been a full length movie. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, for what they gave us, it was very well done. The dialogue was good. The acting was great. But it was just one of those stories where I feel like we did need a little bit more. We could have benefited for a little bit more at least. What did you think? Yeah, like without jumping in, I thought, and I totally agree because I do like a short film format, but this was something where in order for it to really pack a punch, in order for it to really be like, whoa, it needed the longevity. It needed the buildup. Um, It needed time for pretty much the audience to care about what was going on. Yeah. Um, Not to say that it was powerless or anything, but I thought it was good. But I think personally it could have been better. I do recommend it. It's 20 minutes and it's available on YouTube. Um, So now I'd say I recommend it. Um, But now let's, let's jump into the specifics of everything. Let's talk about the plot. I personally think that the plot is the strongest element oh, to yeah. this. Yeah. So Savannah, what did you what were your thoughts on the plot of this short film? Like I said, it's just very he was definitely going for that wow factor and that like shock factor too, because I have, at least for me personally, have not seen a lot of movies that revolve around grief and prostitution especially Mm -hmm. in um males so yes it was definitely a unique story to tell because i'm sure that happens a lot like if i had to guess i'm sure like people do this um and i have to say i liked the ambiguity of it because i like the fact so with this 80 year old man who hires a male prostitute There's, in my opinion, two ways to look at it. And I think there's no right or wrong way. Whichever way you look at it, it doesn't hinder the story. Um, One, it could have been that this man maybe, um, because there's no doubt from watching the movie that he did love his wife. Maybe this man has a deep regret for not telling his wife that he was bisexual or that, you know, just things like that. Or, and what I think leans more to is because of how much he loved his wife ordering a female prostitute felt like cheating definitely I think it could be both I know there was a part where Dylan Sprouse tells him like it's never too late to be yourself so I do think there could have been some under like we we don't know either um there could have been some underlying like suppressed um you know in terms of sexuality and stuff but it Mm -hmm. definitely felt like I don't know, though, about the other theory, too, because he made Dylan Sprouse wear a dress. So it it definitely felt a little, like, role play-ish. Like, he was using Dylan Sprouse to, like, tell his wife things that he couldn't. Like, it it, it was like a replacement, almost. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I agree with that. Or um, it could be seen as, like... um, like I said, if it was a woman in the dress, then he probably would have felt bad if sure. he maybe found this woman attractive because then it kind of would have been like, oh, I'm just replacing you with another woman. Um, but I think all those are totally valid. But I, I do think it's a – and the reason why I think you and I both wish it was longer is because it's a powerful plot. Like this is really good. But it definitely should have been – made for longevity because you just can't fit in all of the emotions within 20 minutes without it being way too overwhelming or even at a point confusing. Yeah, I I know there was a lot of and there's just a lot to unpack. I mean, at one point he's telling like Dylan Sprouse like pretending that it's his wife like, "Hey, I never got to say goodbye to you." There's a scene, a long scene, in fact, where they're dancing and he's imagined he's dancing with his wife. But mm-hmm. one thing I think, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my thought. One thing I really wanted to know more about in the film was Dylan Sprouse's character because it's very interesting how he seemed unfazed the whole time. Like this man had him in a dress. This man was pretending that that was his wife. 
And he seemed like, oh, yeah, this is a regular Tuesday night for me. So it definitely made me interested in his character and, like, the things he had to go through to get to that place, you know? And I think that's where, like, we want more longevity because his character and, you know, um, Ron, uh, Ronald, uh, Ron Rifkin's uh, character were just really just two separate interesting characters that I wish we got to see, um, you know, more of and learn more of about them each. Um, I will say, so with, because uh, you had mentioned the scene of them dancing. This is where one of my critiques are and I'm gonna say critique lightly just because it's more like this is what I would have done and that sounds so damn pretentious but it was really something I was like come on do it just show and it just never happened and it was during the scene where Dylan um Sprouse and Ron Rifkin are dancing and it does like shift a little bit between him dancing and then um them dancing and then him dancing with his wife right. and i remember looking at you and i said i was like they should have done cuts where like for example if um ron rifkin was turning dylan sprouse where it would cut where that clip would end would be in the same position where him and his wife are dancing begins like so that way it just flowed a lot uh, smoother and it just kind of emphasized more that it would recreate that moment for him and things like that right. so that was my one thing because I think it just would have added more power to that scene especially because yeah like they're dancing and stuff but I don't know if they had just made those cuts and those edits and you know did those I felt like it just would have been so much more powerful but that's really me just being a stickler and going this is what I like <laughs> no I think that's valid um I think it's also really interesting because Dylan Sprouse doesn't act anymore from what I understand like he's not in a lot of things yeah so just the fact that he picked like his coming back role to be a male prostitute for an 80 year old man I, I, I just want to know what the thought process was there. Like, I want to know what made him like, you know what? This is worth coming back on camera for. And you know what I think? So I do believe that the director went to NYU. And I know Dylan is also NYU alumni. So maybe, perhaps, they had been in class together or, like, knew each other from there and were okay. friends um, but I mean, regardless, whatever the reason it was, I'm really happy he did this role. Oh, I, yeah, he was fantastic. He was so fantastic in this role. Very subtle, but it was just so good. And we were both talking about how it reminded us of like a young Brad Pitt in like Thelma and Louise. You know, it was just really like overall just a really, really good performance, both from him and Ron Rifkin, if I'm going to be honest. No, two very solid performances. All together, this is a really, again, I think me and you always like to hear about stories, watch stories that are unique. We always talk about how most movies are kind of copy and paste. So to see a short film like this and sort of an outrageous one is very mm -hmm. refreshing. I think everyone should see it. So with that being said, what is your final thought? Uh, I'd give it... And eight and a half out of ten. I would have liked a little bit more context. And altogether, I think I wished maybe we could have moved this to short film to feature film. Gotcha. 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 I'm going to give it a little bit, a little bit harsher. I think this is like one of the first times where we're a little bit more distant on the score. I'm failing 7.2. Okay. I think it's good. But like I said, there's there's just a lot of things because short films are my thing. <laughs> short structures are my thing. Of course. And I just, I feel like it was a solid outline, but there was just some key points that were missing that could have made it feel more full in emotion than, and for us to be like, you know what? It could have been a long film, but it was, it's fine the way it is. Like, we're kind of longing for that emotion and to know yeah. more information. And I think we should have been given a little bit more. I felt like a lot of time was not wasted, but was just focused too much on a, the buildup of everything, you know? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good critique. 
that's a good but that's point. just being a stickler because I'm just <laughs> I, I feel like I really went it's, it's good like I definitely recommend it but that is just me just kind of really fine yeah, tooth of course. combing it of course all right well now Savannah would you like to introduce Tenet Yes. Okay. So Tenet came out this year and is directed by Christopher Nolan. Um, it's about, I'm trying to find like a good summary to this because it's complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, so the IMDb summary is armed with only one word Tenet and fighting for the survival of the entire world, a protagonist journeys through a twilight world of international espionage on a mission that will unfold in something beyond real time. It stars John David Washington, Robert Pattinson, and Elizabeth Debicki. This, uh, so Stephanie, what did you think? Because you saw it, you recently watched it for the first time. I recently did. Um, I saw it a few days ago. And you know what I will say? Without spoiling, if you are looking for like a Chris Nolan banger, like Interstellar, Dark Knight, blah, 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 all those, you're not going to get a banger that big this movie is great but it is a different feel i will say than his other films so if you're expecting like you know all this crazy action and stuff like that with the han zimmer da, 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 all that stuff <laughs> like that i i just don't give your hopes up And I think that sucks with directors like Nolan and Tarantino with Scorsese. You always go in with high expectation because like not only is it just like, oh, they're a good director. Like you're like, no, Chris Nolan is one of the best directors. I feel like people were really harsh on this movie. I really liked it. I think it was brilliant. But compared to all his other films, it is flawed. Compared to something like Interstellar, it is flawed. That doesn't mean... I don't think it's an excellent film. But I think, Savannah, you kind of get what I'm feeling. So without spoilers, how did you feel about Tenet? So I got a lot of heat for my opinion, but I totally agree with you. This movie, I, I if I had to put it in words, is more of a visual experience. Mm-hmm. Um, his special effects, a lot of the scenes in this movie are just amazing. It's the way he does things is fantastic. Plot wise, it has a good amount of flaws. Um, mm-hmm. Like you were saying, it's it's a different movie from Interstellar. If you're looking for something, even I, the Batman series, um, it's how do I put this? It's very distant. Mm-hmm. It's a very distant movie, and I think everyone should go into this kind of with the mindset of, okay, like, this is going to be a visual experience. And I'm going to learn something new about like, the world of time traveling that genre. But if you're looking for a movie where you can connect with the characters and even the plot, I, I would say this isn't it. Yeah, and it, it's such a because like, it's one of those things where if they were like, if someone said to me like, "Oh, have you seen Tenet? It's written and directed by Joe Schmo," I'd be like, "I'll give it a shot." I would be like, "Oh my god, Joe Schmo, what do you do? Like that's in- insane!" But because we've already seen like the wrath of Chris Nolan, it's just like, "Oh, okay." But it 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 sucks too because with all that being said, it, it's a phenomenal movie. It oh, really yeah. is a phenomenal movie. Like, it's just not his phenomenal, like, top best of the best, you know, creme de la creme. Um, so let's let's get into, um, you said that you feel like there's a little bit gaps here and there within the plot. Let's dig into the spoilers and let's talk about where did you see those gaps? Not so much gaps, but flaws. Mm-hmm. I feel like for a two and a half hour movie... If you blink, you miss something. You miss a detail. Yep. The movie is so incredibly fast that you have to grasp a concept at a just, in my opinion, unattainable reach the first time. I've seen this movie three times. Mm-hmm. And each time I understand it better. But I think it's okay to have your audience work a little bit to think. I think that's one of the main reasons why people are fans of Chris Nolan because you come out and you're talking about it. But this movie is so complicated. 
just mm-hmm. to say at the least, with the whole time travel, the whole tent thing. And apparently, we can get into this later, but there is like this underlying meaning from what I hear about faith. So to to have your audience grasp three or four concepts with this incredibly fast movie. And again, it's two and a half hours. So it's not like he really crammed it in at an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, is a bit of a flaw. I think Tenet, and I know Chris Nolan doesn't do TV or whatever. I think Tenet could have really benefit either from having 45 minutes more in the movie or even being a short, a limited series. Because of how yeah, information it is just a lot to unpack. And like at first I was like, man, two and a half hours. Two and a half hours never felt so quick because of how right. like lasered in focus you have to be um into this movie. Some people like that, some people don't. Um I really like the plot, but I'm also someone who I was able to get it the first time. At least I think I got it. Um I was able to get it the first time and understand how it works and I know that I got lucky because like Inception I had to watch three times like I've had to go back so I got just lucky with this one I probably because I didn't have my phone on me I was just lasered in on the you know my screen and things like that but it's a lot to unpack like this idea even like just introducing the concept uh concept of entropy and things like that adding in you know basic science and then breaking it apart and then bre- it's almost like you're taking like an uh, like a sphere of ice and you're just hammering it down until it's just nothing but little little tiny water droplets all over the place it just took like entropy and then just like really just spread it all out I liked that about it, but I'm also someone that learned entropy in physics. And I know not everyone was able to have that experience, you know, prior before going into learning about the movie. Um, so can you and me now discuss, because now we're get, we're full in spoilers, Let can we discuss our opinion on how we think this whole tenant thing and the entropy thing works. I would like to discuss that with you. Uh, sure, Julia. I'll try. So when you have the reversal and kind of kind of like time traveling, like how would you explain that in your own words? Like what did you interpret from the movie? What was going on? Like how t- the time travel thing worked? Yep. Well, it's the whole um, like your, your inverse, right? It's that yes. theory where you're going, yeah, so basically, <laughs> I'm going to try to explain it because, again, for me, it was very complicated. Mm-hmm. You and go- look, we're not, Chris Nolan makes this stuff ambiguous, so I don't think either one, What if we have differing theories, I don't think we're wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Theories, though, like, how it works, because it, it, yeah. it I can tell you what's going on. I don't know how it exactly works, though, because... No, like not just not the plot of it, but like how the reversal, how the inverse of everything works. Do you understand that? Well, basically, you're 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 going um, you're you're backwards, right? Yes. So much, yeah. essentially, what I believe is this whole entropy thing. I'm a little science geek, so I like talking about stuff like this. Um, basically, what my belief is. With all these reversed entropy uh, enthalpies, I think the best way that I saw it explained or ever heard about entropy is, for example, you can put a banana in the fridge and it will slow down the process. But when you put a banana in the fridge, let's say it's like almost ripe. When you go back into the fridge after two weeks, you don't expect the banana to be fresher. And that's kind of how inversing the entropy works and that's how also reversing the entropy of everything would ultimately kill everyone because everyone would be going back and reversing every single thing that they did so that means people would become younger until you know their little babies and stuff like that like that's how that stuff would work um that's how why it was so important you know that's why they couldn't let the thing happen because Everything would just go back to square one, essentially, if the entire world was Right, that was the goal. Yes. 
so when they went into um this i'll call it like a little house of mirrors i think they call it like what the the tell tell us uh it was like the tumbler or something like that where they the went time in time machine thing yeah yeah the time machine thing so it wasn't really a time machine because they wouldn't go back in time i guess the the best thing to say is where these places were you were you would not just go in and come out you would go in and you would change your position so for example if um oh so let's say with those bananas and everything in the fridge if those bananas were um you know getting younger and younger and stuff and this is i'm not a physicist this is just a botch way of explaining it (laughs) if those bananas and everything were getting younger and younger if for some reason the entropy of that thing just shifted to the left you now have two different entropies you have a left banana and a centered banana so that's how that worked. So it kind of formed like a U shape whenever they went in and out because they would come back out in a varying position on the other side. And that's how it allowed two existing entropies uh, uh, to exist at once. Okay. At least that's what I believe it to be. Um, the where it gets confusing though is when they start like inversing the inverses and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Like, really? You're going to go in this deep? I also didn't understand. Like, after a while, I got the inverse thing. I also didn't understand how Neil was here. Because Neil wasn't from that timeline. Mm -hmm. So I was confused. Like, I I assume. So uh, he comes from the the future. No, he comes from the future, right? No, he said he wasn't from the future. You see, I'm still trying to figure it out. No, He's so are from- you talking about like with the ending, essentially? No, no, I know what happens at the end. I just didn't understand because I know, again, we're getting into spoils here, but Neil's character in particular, I know he was hired by the protagonist. Yes. So I didn't know when he was hired by the protagonist. I'm assuming it's in the future, Correct. Uh, I, I actually, I would think it would be when the protagonist went back in the past. So Neil's from the past. Yes. Yes. I think so. When we first introduced Neil, I think he was meant to be in that timeline. That's his correct timeline where he is introduced. It's the protagonist. John uh, David Washington's character, who I think was already looped in. Okay. And the reason why, because, so uh, Neil gets inversed. Um, he has different inverses. So there's an inverse version of Neil that dies in. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. The the thing where it, when it all happened and everything like that. Um, but there's also a part, there's also moments where um i and i think the best thing is is like in the in the beginning like remember the the cia pills yeah 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 so get this why was it that in the beginning it didn't work for john david washington but somehow in the end it was going to work to kill was it kenneth bronin his character because mm-hmm. remember, he holds it up in the end, and he's like, "This will kill me." Well, is it the same thing? Is that what we're supposed to believe? So I think what it would have done is it would have killed. So those two things, I think, by the time could be wrong. I think by the time we already meet the protagonist, he's already been inverted, but he's not living. Th- he's not living the inverse version. He's living the normal wow, version I of himself. Heard that yet. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going in deep. Um, but because that's how he's able to get the message because then he realizes like, oh, so I'm the one. Because in the end, he realizes, oh, I have to go back and send this to myself and tell myself because he was like, because he realizes when he's talking to the the woman, I forgot her name, uh, Sanjay's wife, I believe it was. Um, she, he goes, I was never working for you. I was working yeah, for yeah. me the entire was, time. Right. So then what happens from that point? He has to go back 
And so what does he do? He goes back and he gives himself the mission. And I think what was able to bring him to that miss- mission was giving him that pill. And I think by already at that time, he had been inverted. Because remember, we see the inverted bullets in the, the concert scene. Yes, yes, yes. But we don't ever see the guy who shot them. Do you think maybe, maybe that guy could have been John David Washington's character? The beginning in general is very, like, it, it's very, because it's we don't know why he's there, number one. Why was yeah. he there? You he's know what I mean? Guy. We don't know. But we don't know why he was specifically in Russia with the, so, ta- like, you know what I was, mean? It's very ambiguous. Yeah, it was- It was just a very, like, plain Jane, like, CIA mission. We're stopping a bomb. And we do know that um, Kenneth Bronin was was planned. He was behind the bombing. Yes. He was behind the bombing. Um, And it's just, like, I think the person, like I said, my theory, who prevented, because remember, he was stalled when this person came and almost shot him with the inverted bullet. Right. So I'm wondering if that was supposed to be uh, his character from the future just serving as like a distractant to have occur whatever was going on. Okay. I know Neil was there and he ended up saving him though. Yes. But do you remember when he was like, that he was like dragging the guy through, he was dragging one of the guys through all the seats and stuff when everyone was asleep. By the way, just an overall great shot, you know, scene right there. But when he's dragging everyone who was like dragging the guy who was like within the crowd of all the sleeping people and he had a move and this guy, like he saw the bullet hole and then the bullet came out. Okay, I'm yeah. wondering if at that point, because the whole inversion thing had never been invented. That's the first time we see it. Yes. So who would have given it to the CIA? John David Washington, the protagonist. Okay. So that's where I'm thinking. I, that, it's not a definite theory. I'm not Chris Nolan. I'm not, <laughs> I don't have, you know, any major physics background or anything. But that's, I think that beginning was more than just showing like, what was that weird bullet? I think it was showing like, oh, uh, like this is the start. Okay. Oof. <laughs> Again, for me, it's a okay. Maybe other people got it as fast as you did, and maybe I'm just like struggling. But to me, I don't know. I I think, I think if I'm still trying to figure out a movie a month later, it's a little bit of an issue. And again, this I mean, could be me. I know, and, and I get it. It's kind of like how people, some people, like, I love Inception, and a lot of people love oh, Inception. Inception's great, though. That's but true. Inception did get trippy. Remember, we got in, like, five layers deep into the dreams in that movie, and then it kind of left with that ending where people on Reddit are still arguing, like, no, the sound of the totem at the end dropped, so therefore, it was not a dream. It, it, you know, all the stuff like that. It, it, he likes to keep him stu- his stuff very open for interpretation. Absolutely. But this was, again, like we said, is too fast. Yeah. It's too fast for, in my opinion... People like me who can't retain information that fast. Yeah. Another flaw, and I think this is the main issue, because if the movie's complicated, technically that's my fault for not getting it. Um, It's very emotionally dry. I'm going to be honest. I did not care about the characters as much as I should have. When, spoiler, spoiler alert, when Neil, when we find out Neil dies, I was just kind of like, oh, that sucks. But I didn't care as much as I should have. And it, I think it's a real flaw of the movie because these characters are good. The acting mm-hmm. is good. It's not like a fault of theirs. But it again, it is just very dry. And maybe that's how he wanted it. Maybe he didn't want us to have this connection with the characters but for Mm -hmm. me that's what kind of makes the movie so I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to really get to know them that much even even the bad guy I remember Seder there's 
maybe 30 seconds of his backstory in the movie, which, by the way, is a really cool backstory about how he was able to obtain that much power and stuff. Yeah. 30 seconds and that's it. We should have felt more. We should have we should have felt more about the wife situation. And it situation. was more of like very one dimension emotion. And what did it play on? It played on more common action tropes like anger and fear, but there was no like heartbreak. Like especially like that could have been played so well. But I also have, so like, especially with the mother and son, but I kind of, while you were talking, just looked up theories nope. about Tenet. Nope. I don't like that theory. I know what theory you're talking about. I don't like it. Which it one? Sense. The one Which where it's supposed to be Max. Yes. I don't believe it. I saw videos. I think there's a lot of weak explanations. Um, And to be honest, I... There was no point where you see, like, there was a point where Debaki gets shot. And yes. Robert Pattinson's character is like, yeah, who who cares? She's going to die. Yeah. And if it were, if he were the son, and if Nolan was trying to give us little tiny hints, like, hey, huh, huh, Joe, and doesn't anybody think, like, he maybe he'd be like, uh, okay, let's go save her or something, show a little emotion towards That's her? That's true. That's true. I, I think the reason why I could possibly entertain it is because in the end, once again, I forgot her name, but the Indian woman, she goes to seek to kill out Ka. Yes. In the end. Now, my thing is, is maybe possibly was she trying to kill Kat or was she trying to kill the son? I Again, I could see where you're going with that. I, I'm i reaching. I know I'm, like, reaching for the stars with all this I, stuff. I just would have hoped that, like, even when Christopher Nolan talks about Neil, he literally says, like, oh, yeah, I just I just thought him up. Like, it, it doesn't seem like he's terribly important. So if he was that terribly important to the plot, I feel like maybe he he should have, or if it, if the, you know, theory is true – he definitely would have put something a little bit more than like, oh, Maximilian, if you if you mix it up, it's Neil. The yeah. only plausible thing I, I heard was that he did know the date of when they were at Viet when they were in Vietnam on the boat. But even that is is iffy because Pattinson did this already. So technically mm -hmm. he would know that. Um so I would be really, really surprised if that's what Christopher Nolan was going for. Yeah, I, I do think it's a little bit of a reach. And I do think, like, you're right. When it comes to the character Neil, he was more so as, like, he was really, he was, I think he was a vital character. Um, but he was definitely more so, like, I'm a physicist, so I can explain what's going on. But just a little bit. <laughs> I like how he was a physicist, but he just gave, like, you know, like. The bare information. Inversion for dummies. And, like, just gave him, like, here's a little one sentence to just kind of give you a little bit. Kind of gave you a little bit. Um, and for me, like I said, I like those challenges and things like that with the movie. Um, and it's also, very like, plot driven. I, the movie is completely solely plot driven, and of course, like special effects and editing and stuff like that. Right, and of course, I mean, he does an amazing job with that. Let's be honest, but mm -hmm. it it really relies on for you to be completely invested in the plot. And yeah. the, the mechanics of it all, which is fine. But again, for the talent he has in the movie, like Robert Pattinson is great. I'm happy he's getting the roles he finally deserves. Also, mm -hmm. just to put that in there. Uh, Washington is fantastic. Becky is good. Like for what they were given, they're good. And for me to not know their characters did seem like an odd choice. So. I could understand not knowing John David Washington. I mean, he's the protagonist. That's and fine. It's kind of, yeah. They've already made him a very, like, here I am, take no, me for what no, I am no, type of character. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, now, let me ask you this. So, 
whenever, because I was just realizing, so you're telling me, and this is where I'm like just trying to like confirm, you're telling me that the reason why, so all those people, like I'm talking John David Washington, I'm talking DeBicke, I'm talking Pattinson, I'm talking Aaron Taylor Johnson, which by the way was a little lovely surprise to see him in there. <laughs> um, Aaron Taylor Johnson and that weird inversion, like uh, that team that he had. Yeah, yeah. You're telling me that all of them, in order, because remember, when they're inverted, they speak backwards. Yeah. So all of them had to be inverted. All characters at majority of times are inverted in order for the language to make sense. I assume Like, I'm just realizing, like, how many people are inverted, like, are are inverted. Because if so, because remember, like, when um, Kenneth Bonin was leaving and stuff, and it it kind of mostly sounded like pig Latin. Yeah. Because it was spoken phonetically backwards. So, like, that's where I'm saying, I'm like, and I'm realizing, like, so majority of this movie, at least from airport, the airport scene and onward is inverted. What the whole movie the, from the airport? Majority of it. You lost me. I'm sorry. Because I, I was just thinking about like the way like that they were talking and then you know all stuff like that. Because I was just realizing I'm like, wait a minute. There, if you had one person who was regular and one person was inverted, they couldn't have a conversation together because they wouldn't be able to understand each other. Both would just seem inverted. Oh my god. Wait. So wait. Hold on. Hold on. I'm at a theory here. So wait. When. Okay, so like, for example, when Elizabeth Debicki, Kenneth Bronin are on the one side and they're speaking in inversion, and then we understand, though, what John David Washington's character is saying, what's to denote that he isn't inverted in that moment and Kenneth Bronin and Elizabeth Debicki are in their normal state? That's I, that's beyond me. <laughs> I can't even, like, I'm still trying to fully understand the inversion and what went on with the with, and and you're over here on a different planet than me, <laughs> dude. I'm sorry. so sorry. I should have came more prepared. I thought no, I it, 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 it was just, just something like, that like just dissecting. came to me. I was like, what if maybe like from the get go we've been inverted, and every time we think we're inverting, we're just going the regular way we're supposed to go. I'm doing <laughs> for I'm just having stoner thoughts, and I'm completely sober. Like I just. I'm just bouncing off stuff like that because I think that would be pretty crazy. Dude, it's <laughs> – you know, um, I also wanted to say something about the score of the movie because I think we both kind of have the same feelings about it. Mm-hmm. It's good. I, I'm never going to say it's not – it's good. It's really good. But it, again, lacks. When you listen to – his other scores, Interstellar, Inception, even the Batman series, you can pinpoint what you're thinking about from the movie and how it made you feel. Immediately, when I think Interstellar, I think of the bookcase or I think of when he's crying with his kids. Inception, like there's just immediately when you think of those movies, you think of how it made you feel when you're watching the movie. This one is just very how mechanical it's impressive yeah but i'm not gonna listen to it and have it can a tie with the movie i'm just gonna think oh cool like tenant and i can see that and so but here's why i bounce with the tenant soundtrack it wasn't a hans zimmer score we love hans zimmer and everything i think it's like the best because that's what i'm seeing is up for debate right now no but I do think it's incredibly smart, and here's why. Because the scores themselves are inverted. Oh, no, I know. When I they go this- through in and out. But remember, if you had a huge orchestral piece, and if you reversed it, it's going to sound like doo-doo. It's kind of like, you know, like when people play, like they do the record scratching, and then all of a sudden they're like, the devil is near, is like all you hear is like, <laughs> like when you play a record backwards. To, okay that's yeah. what it would sound like it would not sound nor it we would if honestly like if they had done it like that we would have been like yo is is Hans Zimmer okay like because no, it would have just like, sounded 
he couldn't do the same thing. And it, it's very impressive what he did. But because, again, I think it's a little bit more forgettable in a way. Oh, I I can totally see that. It, it's definitely an underwhelming score. But I do think having an underwhelming score with right, the, the, the reversal and with that really like smartness to it and everything is better than trying to go for a dramatic piece you know, and then reversing it and it sounds like horror to the ears, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I think he didn't have... I... Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, But what do you feel like... Here's a question. Tenet mm-hmm. as a whole of... Because of what a lot of people are saying... If you if you read the, the very angry Reddit, uh, thread. what is it a Willy Wonka prequel? <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Um, but people are saying that if you don't like this movie, or if you don't think this movie is his most impressive, then you just watch Chris Nolan movies for Chris Nolan. So my question is, how do you feel about this movie in terms of? the scale of his career because at the end of the day people are going to watch his movie including us because he has an impressive filmography Mm -hmm. but just objectively speaking how do you feel about this movie in terms of all of it like his whole filmography where does it stand is it the best is it in the middle is it one of his worst movies obviously you know, he doesn't really have a lot of bad movies. So, you know what, before, let me, let me, let me do a little, myself a little solid before entering that. I'm real quickly going to look at his little film, his okay. uh, bio and his biography, not biography, but you know, his film filmography and stuff like that and see what he's done. Honestly. I can see why it, I can, uh, when you see, cause like when you really think about Nolan films, they're all bangers. I looking at this could totally see personally for me, it's not at the bottom. It's like middle, but I could totally see, oh, you know what? I think I might like it more than I'm admitting. I could see why people put it at the bottom, but I, Give your honest would, opinion here. For me, it would be in my top five. And the reason why, and that might be like, ah. like for me, no, this is a movie no. would, because sometimes I, ju- like in terms of movies and things like that, you have obviously awesome movies like Dark Knight, Batman Begins, and you know, the, the Dark Knight series, you have things like Dunkirk, Interstellar, and they're all very different in their own way, but they're all very similar in their own way. They all have that Chris Nolly feel. I like this movie because I feel like it shows more like, oh, like not only is Chris Nolan just a great writer, but I just feel like, I don't know, like it, I just feel like it's a little bit more diverse to his palette like i think interstellar like really showed off like his talent um but i do think doing a movie like this because it's hard with dark knight and things like that because people do superhero films all the time this is like exception i would put it in the same rank as inception because it's an original idea that no one has gone near except him you know this is this is his ground and i think i like it I like no, it. I can see why I, and I was going to say this, this is in my top five too. I know I'm talking a lot about how it's complicated and how um, emotionally distant, but I'm not watching it after I watched it. maybe the second time I realized I wouldn't watch it again for that. But just the sole fact that like this movie is beyond impressive. The idea yeah. is beyond impressive. And without those flaws, it's a fantastic movie. And mm-hmm. like you were saying, it is an original. There's nobody else doing stuff like this. That's the one yeah. reason why people go watch his movies. There is nobody trying to topple these complicated ideas and do a lot of the things he does. 
Mm -hmm. So in that regard, like, absolutely, this is top five. It might be number five for me. Mm -hmm. But again, like, he doesn't make bad movies. So I even think trying to put it somewhere is difficult. Because no matter what, it's still, at least in my opinion, at the very least, even if you hated the movie, it's still a B-plus movie. Which is what most people don't like. Just that in itself is fantastic. Yeah, and and sadly, like I I hate to say it, but like especially with Chris Nolan films, there's always going to be like this stereotype of snobbiness, like oh, oh the I, pretentiousness. I, oh, I the watch NYU. Chris Nolan films. Do you see those TikToks about the NYU white boy film majors? Oh yeah, yeah. Where it's like, oh, like I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm not a director. I'm a filmmaker. And then you just see like a Pinterest style board, and it's like Tarantino, Chris Nolan, and that's it, or Scorsese, and just like all the people that everyone already knows about. Exactly. Um, so there, I can understand why people accuse other people of being pretentious, or just see anybody that goes religiously sees his film as being pretentious. But it's hard because he does make good movies. I think we yeah, can like and, him and just like address that there are other people that are good too. Of course. And I think it's one of those things too, where the reason why I like this film is because, yeah, I do agree with you. I think there are flaws in it, but I'm happy he finally made a freaking flawed movie. Like bring down the king and let me have a <laughs> shot at it. You know? <laughs> you like it so much. No, I also think it's a really good because here's That's the so thing, funny. and this is how I look at it from a director's standpoint. When you just keep making bangers, it's going to get boring and you're never going to learn how to create something new. You're just going to spoon feed everyone the same stuff over and over again. And your mistakes are going to be repeated. Like, or uh, your, 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 what you're good at, your strengths are just going to be repeated over and over again. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes like if this was more so like more dark night stereotypic and stuff like that, the people would love it and people would think right. it would be great, but there's no room for him to learn as a director with the movie like this, with the criticism and everything, there's room for him to learn as a director. There's That's room for him point. to learn as a writer. And it's weird where it's like, I, it's weird for me saying like someone with no Oscar nominations, no feature film movies done to be like, Chris, uh, Chris Nolan, you need to be humbled. We have some bit. notes for you. Yeah, I get what you're saying. But I do think, and that's where like, snobbiness comes in and stuff like that. But that's where I think this is good. I think people are ups upset. It's kind of like, you know, the God didn't give another godly work. It's just kind of like the God gave like, a good work but it wasn't godly and everyone is like losing their heads over it meanwhile you know it's like no could, like yeah you know where we could draw a parallel to what sort of like the irishman with martin scorsese it was a good movie but it wasn't good fellow. it wasn't his best it wasn't his best and it's because he's following his safe pattern he's yeah. following that pattern that everyone loves and knows him for and when you do that eventually people are gonna go dude i'm tired of seeing the godfather four times but in different movies with different names exactly or good fellas i meant to say good fellas not godfather no, no, but exactly and i think i like you said it's it's kind of good that he went with a different element because even if there were flaws Dude, it's still a banger. You could still watch that. Yeah. And like, wow. Like that was. It's really like how I feel with some like, and I've told you before with like Scorsese, some early 2090 Scorsese stuff, except for Goodfellas, doesn't sit right with me. It just at like the whole like Age of Innocence, Man in the Iron Mask, and all stuff like that just doesn't jive with me. But you know what? Those were areas where um, Scorsese got to make mistakes and everything like that. And then what happened? He produced great movies. He produced Shutter Island, which people be sleeping on Shutter Island. Shutter but great. Shutter Island, Silence, Hugo, things that he was totally not known for. And sadly, it kind of went into like the, everyone was just kind of like, what happened to the gangster films? And then he finally wrote The Irishman, which I, like I said, The Irishman is good a good movie. film. Just not. It's a very good movie, special. but it just kind of felt like his safe zone. I do think this was a little bit of his safe zone, Chris Nolan, 
but I'm hoping he can definitely try something different. Like I would definitely like he's explored themes of love and things like that. I would really love to see a more solid romance film from him or even a more solid crime film from him. Please. You know, one of my favorite directors, Richard Licklater, Mm -hmm. the one that did the four trilogy and uh, And boyhood. Yes. And people argue that a lot of his films follow the same pattern. Like let's, let's be honest. He does the whole time period pieces, even dazed and confused could be looked at as like okay like that's like a time thing yeah because uh his movies either take place in like a different decade or like his movies take place for decades so i don't know if you heard but i heard recently that he's doing the same thing but in a musical format (sighs) it's just one of those things where i think he's Uh, he's tiptoeing but he's sticking to what he knows and I think as a director you're gonna have like you're gonna have stuff that you're gonna be known for but don't be afraid to tiptoe around like for example I write dark stuff and only dark stuff does that mean I'm gonna write dark stuff and just live like a a Edgar Allan Poe life with my (laughs) writings of depression no I will write something comedy one day and it may not work I might write something romance and it may not work and people might go no go back down but you only become better at what you're good at if you try other things that you're maybe not so good at I very much agree I think um my favorite hold on I'm trying to make sure I'm correct on it. Oh uh, no, I was thinking of the director. I always get confused with Linklater and the director of her, Spike Jones. Um mm-hmm. I was gonna say <laughs> I was actually gonna have the audacity to say like my favorite Richard Linklater movie is Jackass 2, but that's actually Spike Jones. So I apologize for the disgrace. Spike Jones went from Jackass to her. But, dude, that's that's what I'm talking range, about. Range right there. That is what I'm talking about. Like, you have to have directors with range. And, like, Scorsese has proven he has range. You know, even Tarantino, to a certain extent, he has the similar flair. But plot-wise, he jumps around. It, he he does. does jump he's around and stuff like that. And, like, yeah, he, he's done a lot. Recent years, he's got comfy with like going back in time, going going to Hitler's, you know, going to going to uh, Sharon Tate's and all stuff like that. But he's still like, you know, he's still bringing entirely different stuff. Whereas people like Scorsese kind of fall going to their failsafe. People like, oh Lord, forgive me, um, Ardi- Guardian Zowl's legend Gahul. What's his name again? I I could please. <laughs> what a, the the amount of disrespect I I have and the audacity I have is insane. But like you know things like that. Don't this play is, it safe. What's his name? What's his name? We have to figure out his name because this is Zack his. Snyder. Yeah, this is the podcast against him. <laughs> this have- is it. We're we're no longer a Purple Luna podcast. We're the the anti Zack Snyder group or whatever we'll call it. If we ever record a podcast. Like we're Bustus League. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> if we ever record a podcast, we have to get a giant poster of the Guardians of the Gahul, that one behind us. Just that. No, oh my god! Could you imagine? Like, imagine like we're an alternate universe, right? And we have a radio station. We're doing this, but radio station style. And we get a call, and it's just someone going like, "Screw you for saying blah 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 about Justice League." And we're like, "Oh yeah, whatever. You're just a nobody." And he goes, "Screw you. I'm Zack Snyder." All the confidence will leave my body right then and there. I'll. I'll it'll be horrifying, dude. That's what you're afraid of. You're afraid of. I'm afraid of Lars von Trier coming to find us. That's my fear. You know I can what? take. I can take Schneider, the Guardians of the Kahu. I'm not scared of Guardians of the Kahu Owl guy. I'm a little bit more intimidated by Lars von Trier. But okay, here's the thing. I feel like he would be the type of guy, Lars von Trier, to look at you and and like he, he would just diss you. He would just not like what you have said or anything. He would just go up to you and it would totally be unprovoked. You'd be like, hi, nice to meet you. And he would just look at you and be like, 
I don't like your bangs. And would just, <laughs> just try to destroy you in that moment. And then he, I feel like he would look at me and be, be like, yo, Vid. Like that. <laughs> but wouldn't talk to me a lot, you know? I would always be like on the fence with him. I'd be like, I don't know if you like me, sir. You just kind of said that you like that I'm weird. But I don't know if you have respect for me. So <laughs> that's how I feel what would happen <laughs> if fine. we met I Lars can, von Trier. If, if, that, if that's all it is, I can I didn't mean that. to attack your bangs. I love your bangs. I just feel like he would sort – he would go he that would just low. find something, of course. No, I, I, I've dissed him on this podcast. You know what, though? He's a good director. There you go. He's very talented. He just scares me a little bit. But there's and also someone like who remote. kind of – he kind of plays it safe. You know, he just does with the – the same, like, you never know, like, do, have you noticed, like, with Lars, there's never, like, oh, there's a cheeky little film by Lars out right now. It's a little fun little thing. No, all of this stuff is, like, going to scar you. You're going to have to sleep on it for three days. Yeah. You know? You're yeah. going to have to call up your psychiatrist and be like, it's been a bad day. Uh, it, like, it, it, <laughs> like, but it, that's, yes. that's a theme. That's a theme. Yes. Exactly. You wouldn't, I, I don't think in our lifetime we would see, like, a comedy by Von Trier. It wouldn't be funny. <laughs> That's for sure. He'd be like, it's a comedy. And then we'd watch it and we'd be like, you sure? <laughs> I feel like he can be funny though because of the Jack, like that movie, uh, The House That Jack Built. It was, they had some funny scenes. It was dark humor. It was very bleak. Like it's, it's like a nervous laugh, but I that, that's it. not funny. Nervous laugh is I'm scared, you know? <laughs> like that's horror. When you say like ha ha, ha nervous laugh is not humor. You're right. <laughs> Just because you laugh that doesn't mean that's the correct reaction <laughs> for what you saw in that movie. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Um but as we were saying, definitely credit to Christopher Nolan for doing something different. <laughs> credit to chris nolan for humbling yourself <laughs> <laughs> oh god stephanie we're gonna make enemies on this podcast no i love chris nolan i love, love it i think I, I i also don't think chris nolan he doesn't strike me as the type of director where he would be like who who are you like he would he would be like oh like he doesn't seem like the person where if we were like hey wasn't your best, but hoped it humbled you a little bit. I don't think he would be like, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Never heard of it. Goodbye. Like, I don't <laughs> think he would be like that. No. But I think he'd be chill about it. I think he'd be like, huh, that's what the critics say. He seems like a nice guy. I hope that's true. I hope that's true, too. But what is your final score on Tenet? Okay. This is really hard. But I am going to give it a 9 out of 10. Because other than the few flaws, and the flaws, you know, I, I think, like you said, it, it's definitely something you see in the movie. It's definitely something I noticed and was a little disappointed by. But the movie itself is fantastic. There's a lot to look forward to. There's a lot to see. And you're still going to come out like, in my opinion, just very and excited. I, from I what will say for a two and a half hour movie, the it, it's Wait. so impressive, the rewatchability of it. Oh, I'm going to watch that movie. I know 10 more times. Absolutely. You're, you're, this is a movie you're going to want to see a lot. And the movie is pretty versatile in the sense of like, you could watch it by yourself. It, it can be a good um, movie night if everybody's paying attention. Um. You could watch it on the plane. Like, it, in my opinion, there's a lot of settings where you can watch this movie. So, and, and watch it a bunch of times. So because of that, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Even with the flaws, it's still a banger. I recommend it highly. What do you give it, Steph? I'm I'm right there with you. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 as well. Um, And, and for me, it really, like that, because... Yes, it is flawed, but it's flawed for Chris Nolan. It's not flawed in terms of as a movie and stuff like that. It's a great, it's a great movie, and we just went at it with a fine tooth comb and everything like it because we we know what to expect from that director. Yeah, and some expectations did fall short because we know his strengths and weaknesses. And in this one, 
you know, he just didn't play up his strengths as much as he should have. But it's still, with all that being said, it sounds like we're just putting a nail in his coffin. But no, like, that we're praising him. He's a fantastic director. And this movie is solid. And I think also it's so... One of the best things about Chris Nolan films is the rewatchability of it. Like, yeah. I could see Inception in interstellar and even like my lesser favorites like the some of the dark knight series like some of those films and stuff like that i could rewatch those over and over and over again and not that can't be said with every director like i there's some obviously directors out there like tarantino blah 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 the list goes on but this movie is definitely i would think probably his the film i think i will rewatch the most of his Okay. And okay. I say that because Interstellar, great, but long and very emotionally draining. It is true. You know, same with Inception and and even the some of the Dark Knight movies. They're they're just a like little too long. They're just at that like three hour mark where it's like it, it's beyond that re that for me, that threshold of like, can I just sit down and watch this at no, any absolutely, time? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you like this movie? Prestige? I actually never seen the Prestige. <gasps> you gotta watch the Prestige. It's I know, really I know. Cool. It's one of your. It's isn't it your husband's favorite movie? My husband talks about that movie once a week. He recommends <laughs> it to everybody we meet ever, even if it's just a random person. Oh, another thing is, I've heard. I don't know if you've seen it, but I heard one of his lesser known films, Insomnia, is also is also a good movie. That's something we could. Uh, yeah, and then he also has a film that's in the Criterion called The Following. What are we doing? I know. We got to get – okay, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. No, but, like, it overall, like, solid film. I just like how you just were like, what are we doing? Why do we not know? I, I love that expression. But, um, yeah, 9 out of 10 for me. It's a It's a really, really good movie, honestly. All right. All right. So what are we reviewing next week? What's I, I totally so, forgot. Next week, what we have planned is I have it written down. I believe it is a two parter, um, meaning it's a part one and part two of a movie. Oh, my God. Where did it go? You can hear me clicking because I'm looking for the file on my computer. It was one of those things where I was like, don't forget to remember to plug in the next movie. And I totally <laughs> forgot to look at the thing. Um, let's see. So if I look at our master sheet, um, the next one that we're going to see um, is actually a newer Criterion release. So now we're kind of going back into our old little alphabetical ways with the Criterion and Criterion channel. Um, and we're going to kind of go in blind with a movie called Five by Two. However, for some reason, if that doesn't work out, the next one is going because I like I said, that's just pulling it from the list it might be a short film i gotta look into it um but if not then we will be looking at the two-parter the original 47 ronin very cool so, i'm excited yeah. so thank you guys so so much for listening um as always thank you sensei david homeboy james and if you would like a shout out please definitely check out our um patreon down below you can get a shout out for as little as a dollar a month and speaking of um dollars if you have another dollar you know that you just want to get rid of and send to the wind um <laughs> sorry that was an awful like that was like the worst like broadway style voice i've ever done but i wrote a new short story and it is called decay and when i mean short i mean like less than 10 pages short hence why it's a dollar on amazon um, but definitely check it out. Um, the money does go help into funding Purple Noon and things like that. Um, yes, so, yes, yeah, yes. be sure to check it out. It's a little experimental piece I wrote, available on Amazon now. Decay by Stephanie Conti. Oh, check it out, guys. It's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Um, and with that being said, we thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.